So look, sending, getting spam, sending mass amount of emails is, is annoying. Not only from a recipient and receiving, you know, an, bad emails or things that are not relevant, but also from if you're leveraging cold email as a channel for growth, you probably want to make sure you get results. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, increasing response rates and sales without annoying the whole world. So a little bit about me, I run Web Profits, a growth marketing agency, and I'm also a partner at a company called Ramp Ventures. We run Mailshake, uh, a couple other SaaS tools, but enough about me. I want to talk about um, really what this presentation is about. It's going to be a marketer's take on sending cold emails. So as a marketer, we're looking at metrics. We're looking at uh, measuring. We're looking at adding value. Very, very kind of different mindset to sending emails. I'm thinking about this as an email marketing campaign, as a nurture campaign rather than a sales um, campaign. But ultimately, marketing and sales people's goals is the same at, you know, building an audience, getting sales, driving conversions. And that's how we're going to think through this. So um, the number one metric I really focus on is the response rate because everything else is irrelevant. So I urge you to, to look through your cold emails, look through what you're doing and think about is your responses, are your responses, are they getting, are your emails getting responses? And what is that number? How can you improve it? Because open rates, what that tells you is how many people look at it. But what it doesn't tell you is how long they look at it for. Is it just an open and they close it? Is it, are they annoyed when they open it? They don't tell you that emotion, but when they respond, that either you get negative feedback, you get neutral, they're not interested, um, or you get positive feedback. And, and either way, it's all learning and growth. So I'm gonna go through a few tactics I recommend using, and some of these, to be honest, you should be, these are the fundamentals, some of the most basic things that I see being ignored. At Mailshake, we're a cold email tool, one of the simplest and kind of lowest price in the market. And we've sent in the last six months about 10 million emails. I've audited every one of these emails and campaigns and, and looked through the metrics, and I still see a lot of the basics being missed. And when the, when the things like uh, a clear call to action is added, it increases the success rate. So the first thing I want to share is when you're sending a cold email, make sure your call to action is clear. It's easy and have a low, having a lower friction ask can drastically increase um, your response rate. What I mean by this is at the end of the day, make it clear at the very end of your email at the bottom just through spacing what the call to action is, what you want somebody to do. If you're asking people to jump on a phone call, five, 10, 15 minute phone call, well, the chances of response rate is gonna be drastically reduced. Whether, um, because taking someone's time, scheduling that time is, is, is gonna be a, a fr pretty high friction point. Instead, ask if, uh, if, ask a question like, are you having a problem with this issue? And you can get the yes, and or no, if the, and if the, obviously the problem is no, that might not be something you want to pursue on. But having a yes, no answer or even just asking, are you having this problem? And then getting that conversation started and then asking the let's set up a call can result into one, a lot less annoying emails. And, and, and two, the net result of higher emails to phone calls ratio. Number two, and this works like a charm all the time is engaging on social media before you send that email. So yesterday, last night, I actually sent two emails out, about 70 emails. Uh, I'm speaking at two conferences, one in Boston and one in Atlanta. And so every time I go to a conference, I reach out to um, cold emails to all the VP of marketing, CMOs, and I organize a dinner. I usually pay for the dinner, ends up being 10 to 20 people or 10 to 15 people. Um, that show up and, and, you know, we want to keep a very specific account. It's very private. So it's no one sharing this information. I generally know two or three people. So I sent this cold email out last night, but what I did as before I sent this email out is I looked at everyone's LinkedIn profile. In fact, 
how I got their email in the first place is was finding it through their LinkedIn. But I looked at their LinkedIn profile. If they've shared anything on their feed, I engaged by liking their something on their feed. I also followed them on social media. Now, if you combine that with a good email and I have a good social proof, um, you know, I have a high friction ask, but I'm, I'm sending in a very small volume, the success rate of these emails, I, I'll tell you, this has been, it's only been about, um, about 16 hours since I sent them and I've already got both dinners full. That means 15 seats have already been taken from 30 emails or so for each dinner just because I engage with them on social media. I, I can tell you this because the last time I sent this to an Austin based dinner, it, it had the exact opposite results. And I, uh, and the only thing I have changed is the social media. So engage with people on social media. All right. The next two things I want to share is, is more of a marketing approach. Again, I, this is a marketer's take on cold email. Uh, num tactic number three is take some of your best content from your blog, take an ebook and use that to send to people instead of now, instead of saying, Hey, do you want to set up a 15 minute phone call to discuss how it can sell you on whatever the hell you're selling, send them something of value. In fact, we use this exact tactic for Mailshake when we get customers for cold email. So we cold email people and we send them our email playbook our email outreach and cold email playbook, playbook.mailshake.com. There's a link at the end, but um, I found to have a much, much better response rate when I send people emails with content because as a piece of content can add context, it's helpful, it's non-threatening and all you're doing is attempting to add value. Now, when you combine that with number four is using retargeting and link-based retargeting, you can use things like ad links, retargetlinks.com. And essentially you, you set up your content and you, you put a, you, you use their re their, um, their redirect links to essentially put the pixel on your pieces of content. So when they open whatever you send them, hopefully it's a blog post, ebook or something of value or your website. You can then read market to them on Facebook and AdWords. And I found that again, just to reduce the friction to add that validation, right? So for example, if you get a cold email out of the blue, okay, you open it, you click on the link, but you don't respond. Well, though that the people that you don't respond to, but they open and click on your email, when you send a follow-up email, do, are they going to respond there? They will, it will increase the chances of them responding to your follow-up email drastically because they will see you in between the time you send the email and they open and click on it to the time you send a follow-up. Let's say it's three to five days between that time. They will have seen some of your remarketing. The perception is very, very key. You don't have to be advertising everywhere. You have to be advertising just to your audience. And, and again, like retarget links and spending the small amount on, on remarketing. I'm talking about five, $10 here can drastically increase um, your cold email response rate again on that second follow-up because from the first time to the second time, they've seen you all over the web. Your credibility is high. It's not, hey, who's this random person? It's this, oh, who's this company emailing me? I've seen their stuff. It's kind of relevant. All right. Off to the second uh, or the fifth tactic here is to customize just the first and last sentence of the email. So the meat of the email can be the same but if you, if you customize the first sentence and the last sentence, it can go a long way. I typically use text replacements or custom field functionality with any cold email tool to do this. Meaning if I'm sending, let's say I'm sending an article or I'm sending, uh, I'm saying, hi, blah, blah, blah. I'm a big fan of blah, blah, blah. Like I'm going to adjust those blah, blah, blahs with text replacements to what is specific to their company, maybe a specific article that would be re relevant to them. And that last sentence is typically that call to action or um, that social proof. For example, if you're sending uh, a, a, the same campaign to SMBs versus you're sending it to, let's say, you're still SMB focused, but maybe some of the higher end ones, or you're, you're sending it to SMBs and some of them are restaurant owners and some of them are, are coffee shops. Well, you might want to customize those emails 
to be more coffee specific or restaurant specific. And, and again, these are, this is kind of examples I'm using based off of emails we've, we've done. Um, but send customized things, take that extra step. Not only will you will have a better success rate, you'll annoy less people, but I can tell you from looking at again, 10 million emails, your deliverability improves, your spam rating decreases because now you're not just sending let's say 10,000 emails, you're, if this is, you're gonna send to 10,000 people, you're sending unique emails 10,000 times. A portion of your email is somewhat customized. And what I've found, when you've personalized an email, the open rate is three times higher than, or not sorry, not three times higher, the response rate is three times higher. And you can see here, even the open rate is higher all because you've personalized your emails. All right, next thing here is your emails should be three sentences max. This is a very, very hard rule to follow. It is not something that, um, it is not something that I or anyone can continue to do, uh, but it's, if you go after this rule of three sentences max, you maybe end up with a five sentence email. But think about this way, right? Your first, um, Think about your email as an ad copy, right? As if you're writing AdWords, AdWords doesn't care if you have, oh, I just need to squeeze an extra word. I need to squeeze an extra, extra sentence. No, it, it, it's, you have a defined number of characters you can use per line and that's it. Your Facebook ad copy as a marketer, you have a defined number, a defined limit. Your emails should have you should be thinking about your emails as having a defined limit. Just because you can say a lot doesn't mean you should. And it takes a genius to say something in five or 10 words. So you have to be that genius. And keep in mind, when you include this, um, include it includes a, a the call to action. So of your three sentences, one of them is gonna be your call to action. So you really only have two sentences and making sure you're call to action is short and sweet is going to be very, very helpful. Now, this is an example of an email that is not three sentences because let's face it, it's very hard to have a three sentence email, but if you hit that rule, you go by that rule, you might end up with a five sentence email. But the very least, if you can't hit that three sentence rule, make your email scannable. This is a good example uh, of a scannable email. You can see the bullet points. If I read this email, what I immediately go to, and oddly enough, this is from Yesware, uh, one of our competitors, but I don't care. I wanna share with you guys really good information of who does it well. I immediately go to the sentence right above um, the, the bullet points. Why? Because the bullet points catch my eyes. And then at the end, I skip the first two paragraphs. I just skip the first two um, sentences. I go straight to that, that third sentence and I go to the call to action. That's because this email is geared towards adding value and, and making it scannable. So um, what do you guys, um, I can't see you guys' screen yet, but think about what your eyes go to when you see this email. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be similar to what I, uh, what I see. Now, this is something that really, really frustrates me when people don't do, which is having a manual review process, scrub process. Um, so first and foremost, if you're doing cold email, please, please, please use tools like bounceless.io or never bounce to essentially scrub your email list because high bounce rate is gonna have a high, is gonna make your spam rating go up, meaning your deliverability is down and AKA your success rate is down. There's everything kind of is affected by your deliverability. So scrub your list. That's the first thing you should do for you, especially if you bought a list and let's be honest, Everybody's always, everybody's bought a list at some point and sent an email. I won't tell a few all, but let's face it, it's been done and people do it regularly. But especially if you scrape the list, you want to scrub the list, uh, scrub your list to make sure the bounce rate um, is good and you're getting only sending to the right email. Even if you get verified emails, you still can have a bounce. Now, take it one step further. What I do is I have an intern, like an entry level employee or uh, for my SDRs, I essentially have an intern or kind of an ops person that helps me, helps the SDRs filter through their list. 
And what we do is, what, what they're doing is taking a cognitive approach, a manual review of looking at, okay, who is, um, is this thing relevant to this person? What I, what, what I find a lot of times happening is that even if you scrap, scrape, buy, sell, like manually put a list together, well, you end up with a lot of irrelevant people. And it's not a lot. It's just a, a lot could be five people on a 5,000 person list, but it's never been about numbers. It's been about penetration of how many people you can penetrate uh, and, and get a response from. So manually scrub that list, look at context, um, what, I, what you find is you're going to remove the Bill Gates of the world. You're going to remove the people who are obviously not a fit for it. And it's very easy to tell uh, based off the name, the company, their position. Again, if you have all this information, their website, uh, who's just not a good fit. You want to remove some of these people immediately. And a human review uh, will help you do that. Um, just as I said, and this is one of the things that is, again, as a marketer, I like to, I like to kind of figure out everything about my customer, stalk them a little bit, and then go after them. So um, just as I said uh, previously around engaging with people on social media, before you engage, stalk them. Look at what's interesting about them. Um, look at what they have posted on LinkedIn. See if you can find um, something relevant or something that is unique about them that you can then include into your emails. Again, with textual placement and some personalization, you can include something quirky. Like for example, if you were to email me in the summer, you, you can find out where I live. So LinkedIn tells you where I live. I live in Austin, Texas. If you email me in the summer and you just acknowledge that Austin is really, really hot, or you acknowledge that you love the barbecue in Austin, those are two things that you can quickly figure out by knowing that I live in Austin and being relatable to me. I will acknowledge the fact that you put in time and I will likely more respond to you. In fact, I may not respond to your cold email regard, you know, whatever, if you want a 15 minute call, but I will agree that it is hot. And now if you know, if you've taken one more step further than just look at where I live and you can tell uh, by my Twitter or Facebook, profile that I hate the heat and that I always travel during the summer just because I hate the heat. And so if you said it's hot in Austin, I bet, I bet it's really hot in Austin. Where are you off to these days to avoid the heat? Um, that will get me to at very least respond or at least nod my head. I'm like, this guy gets me. Now those two things you can find out with five minutes of research. So just as I said in this previous one, manually review, Go get that same person that's manually reviewing it and try to find something interesting. So I urge my SDRs to when they build a list to find, to include not just the name, the company, the position, their website, social media profile, but I try to include what's an interesting fact. And then I will then customize this profile. Now, what that usually means are my campaigns are much, much smaller. They take a lot longer. Um, but what it means is I'm not sending out thousands of emails. I'm sending out now 300 emails, highly personalized and specific. And I'm including something interesting with that person. And again, five minutes of research, you can find out I hate the heat and I travel a lot during the summer. Um, and you can find out very similar information on anyone else. LinkedIn is great. Twitter, Facebook, Facebook's pretty uh, oftentimes tough, but um, if you can find their LinkedIn, and they're public about Facebook or they're public. You can find the website, the blog, medium article, a medium site, or, um, a, um, or, or their, their Twitter handle. All right. Now, remember I said, keep your email short, three sentence and scannable. You need to have social proof. Who are you? Why are you contacting me? Why should I listen to you? Why are you an expert in this thing? What are you selling and why is it better than anyone else? These are all the things I think about in the first five, 10, seconds, even two seconds of, of just opening that email, seeing that subject line and whatnot. Well, you can't include all this information because uh, you're going to overwhelm people. Uh, so use your signature as a, as a, as a place to put social proof. You have 10,000 customers. Great. Use your signature. Look at a landing page. You don't see social proof, 
uh, above the call to action, you see it right below. So if you look at a landing page, in fact, go to mailshake.com at some point, what you're going to see as our social proof is where we've been featured on. What you're going to see as social proof is how many emails we've sent. These are things that are right below the call to action, right around there. And if you look at just below this, above this, above the fold, you'll see all our logos. We've decided that's the social proof people need. We're going to be testing soon if that social proof works out versus how many customers we have, how many emails we've sent. Um, but those types of things are what you want to test out or, or, or include in your emails at the very bottom. You write for a publication, you have X amount of traffic, you've been featured in different places, you have this, these seven customers, you have case studies, put those in your email signature, put them as links, places. These are things that even if people say no to you, they might actually look, uh, click on these other things. And again, that follow up or something else, you can get them elsewhere uh, with remarketing and whatnot. So um, your three sentence rule does not apply, or your scannable does not apply to your signature and use that wisely, just as marketers do on landing pages. All right, this is another thing I see way, way, way too often is, is follow up email saying, hey, did you see my last email? Yes, I saw your freaking last email. I don't care, I still don't care. Um, continuing to follow up three, four, five, seven times. You guys know about this, uh, the, the zebra. Hey, did you get lost? Did, did, a zoo, uh, did a zebra escape from the zoo? I haven't heard from you, just checking if you're okay. Just respond if you're interested or you're not interested so I can opt you out and eat, stop emailing you. Well, that whole chain of emails is flawed. And yes, when you send somebody a stupid email like that, you get a response. But yes, generally the response is, I'm not interested, stop emailing me. And even if the response is like, ah, that's interesting, it's, it's generally bad sentiment. You've already annoyed people and then you kind of got some people back. It could work, but the thing is, what people don't think about, especially on the sales side, is how many people you've pissed off. As a marketer, I know there's finite amount of traffic, there's finite amount of, um, and there's a hard cost, like I gotta spend money to get traffic. So I make sure everything I do is at the best, highest caliber. And I think you should be doing that same on the sales side, on the cold email side. So instead of following up with saying, did you get my last email? Did you open my last email? And let's face it, you're, the email campaign is probably only following up on people that have opened the email, have not responded. But why not say, hey, uh, I wanted to share this article with you. I thought of you, think that might be helpful for your position. What do you think? Um, and, and just end it with what do you think? So you're sending something valuable. If you continue to follow up with just educational, helpful articles, nobody gets pissed off by making, but if you're sending articles that are helpful, they get pissed off if you continue to say the same thing over and over again. If you continue to be persistent when you've already lost the deal, when you've already lost the mind share. So send helpful, high value, educational stuff and use, use your blog, use your content. Um, talk to the marketing team and just see, ask them what's the most beneficial pieces of, uh, or not beneficial, what's the highest traffic, most engaged traffic, uh, content pieces. They're going to send it to you. They'll gladly send it to you because guess what? Marketers want traffic. They want exposure and they want penetration. So if they know you're already sending to, to customers, they might as well get, um, have you send it. Now, another thing you can do here, and this is probably not included in this presentation, um, or it's not relevant for this presentation, but as a salesperson, or if you're doing cold email, get, tell your, you're, you're, you're talking to your customers. You know, their objections, you know, what their concerns are. Tell, give the marketers that feedback and see if they can create content off of that. And then you can have content that's specific to, to, uh, to your, to your emails. All right. So again, um, we've tested this based off the number of emails, um, or based off of mail shake emails. And we've found that subject lines with five words or less have much, much higher emails. I mean, uh, open rates. Um, this was initially tested off a 6.1 email sent in through Jan one to April ish. But now we've actually continued this test and it still stands true. I believe it's about 20, 20 to 25% higher open rates with subject lines with five words or less. So what are you doing using these long lengthy subject lines? Keep them short, keep them punchy, keep, um, keep them customized. 
And again, as a marketer, when I look at these things, I look at, um, I look at how do I optimize this ad text for click through rate? How do I, how do I have the best headline that really, really hits home? As a, as a, as a person doing cold emails or a salesperson, you should be doing the same thing, thinking about that way. So, um, just like Upworthy and, and kind of Elite Daily, these guys test 20, 30 different subject lines or, uh, sorry, they test 20 different, uh, 20, 30 different titles for each blog post. And then they, they go through which one sounds the best. You should be writing 25 different subject lines for your email campaigns. The very act of writing 25 different subject lines, you're going to weed out the ones that are automatically stupid. And I guarantee you the first five you write, will likely not be the ones you choose um, because that sixth one, the fifth one, whatever that, that the, the first ones are just getting everything out of your head. After you kind of write a couple dozen out there, you're going to find the ones that are really good. And what you'll, this will help you do is you're kind of saving a lot of the AB testing for just the qualitative perspective. You again, you're going to weed out a lot of the, of the bad ones. And now again, um, lastly, look at this article from CoSchedule. Um, on how to write better headlines. This how to write better headlines 100% directly correlates over to how to actually um, write better subject lines because it's the same principles, the same copywriting principles for subject lines as it is headlines of blog posts because you still only have a fraction of their brain power, a fraction of their time for a subject line or when you look through uh, when you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and that you see a Facebook ad or a piece of content, same thing pro applies. And um, the, another thing I want to share with you guys is personalization. Remember I, earlier I said personalize the first and last sentence, but only personalize. My recommendation is only personalize the first and last um, sentence of your emails because over personalization could also lead to one, the wrong personalization, two, too long emails, and three, just being too creepy or annoying, right? Uh, if you tell me I live in Austin, you know it's hot, and you know I escape, but then now you tell me you know where I like, you know where I'm at right now, three things might be too much. So just focus on the personalizing just the right amount. And with that, let's talk through the key takeaways. These are the three things. If you do nothing else, if you do nothing else besides three things, first and foremost, engage on social media. I can tell you firsthand and from analyzing um, tons of email ad, uh, campaigns that engaging on social media will drastically improve your open rates, your response rates, and reduce the annoyance because social proof and, 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 when you engage on social media, it's not as cold of an email. It's a little bit warmer. Number two is to keep your email short and scannable. Again, three, I challenge you to write emails that are only three sentences. Really, really hard to do, but at the very least, you can keep them short and scannable. Remember, nobody wants to read a 300-word uh, email. It's just too long. I don't ever read a 300-word email. And lastly, number three is to leverage your ebooks, content, anything you have from the marketing collateral or your blog in your sales email. When you follow up, send more valuable content because if you keep making me smarter, at some point I'm going to find, I might just respond to you at the very least. And I want to leave you guys with one book. Um, we talk a lot about these, you know, 13 different things, but there's a lot more details that go through um, around improving your cold emails. So check out playbook.mailshake. It's completely free. I'm not trying to sell you anything at all. At the very least, scanning through it will help you increase your open rates, response rates. And if you follow those three takeaways from before, will reduce the annoyance you have on the world.